Hey everybody, Brian Allred, teaching pastor of New Life Presbyterian Church in New Yorktown, and welcome back to our series on Forgiven and Forgiving, where we are exploring the Bible's teaching on this important topic of forgiveness, and we're doing it by emphasizing four different things. Uh, the mandate for forgiveness, the meaning of forgiveness, the misunderstandings of forgiveness, and the motives for forgiveness. Uh, just by way of review here, as we're in the midst of this series, uh, we looked at the mandate of forgiveness to start out with. We looked at passages like Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, uh, the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35, uh, all which give uh, a clear teaching on the mandate uh, for forgiveness, the mandate for us to forgive others. And then we uh, explored the meaning of forgiveness. What exactly uh, does the Bible mean with forgiveness? And we looked at a couple Greek terms to try to arrive at this understanding. And so I've landed here with kind of a working definition of forgiveness. And that is that forgiveness is a renouncing of bitterness, resentment, and malice toward the person who wronged us, as well as letting go of claims to personal vengeance and opting for love, care, and goodness over evil. And so that's the meaning of forgiveness. And we are kind of in the middle right now of the misunderstandings of forgiveness. There are seven of them that I want to cover with you. And we have looked at five of them already. Uh, so again, just by way of review here very quickly as we start this new video, uh, forgiveness does not mean a feeling. Um, that doesn't mean there's not feelings that accompany forgiveness from time to time or, or often. Uh, but it, it means that forgiveness can't be reduced to feeling a particular way. And certainly if we think that, that, that forgiveness requires us to feel warmth toward the person who wronged us, especially right after the person wronged us, uh, that would be a wrong-headed um, notion of forgiveness. And it would make forgiving someone more difficult if, if, if we thought that that was part of the essence of what it meant to forgive and we were, we were required to do that. We would bear a lot of guilt feeling like well, we haven't actually forgiven that person because we don't feel warmth for that person. But it's a very freeing thing to recognize that you don't have to feel warmth for that person to actually be able to forgive that person. Forgiveness also doesn't mean denying the wrong. Uh, actually, forgiveness means uh, it assumes that there's a wrong. That forgiveness comes into play when you acknowledge that a wrong has been done and you decide to forgive that wrong. If there's no wrong that's been perpetrated, uh, there's no need for forgiveness. Forgiveness only comes into play when there's a wrong. Uh, forgiveness also doesn't mean forgetting. Uh, we don't have that kind of control over our memories, and so that's an unrealistic expectation to assume that to forgive someone means you have to forget that it even happened and, and blot it out from your memory. You can't do that. We can forgive and still remember. Forgiveness does not mean surrendering justice. Now, it does mean not seeking to enact that, judge, uh, that justice through acts of personal vengeance. Forgiveness does mean that. It means um, letting go of claims to personal vengeance, as we saw in the meaning of forgiveness. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we no longer care about justice. It means that we hand over the securing of that justice ultimately to the Lord uh, and perhaps also to civil authorities who um, are entrusted uh, to, to govern and to secure justice in cases where it needs to be um, meted out. And then the fifth thing we looked at was forgiveness does not mean trusting. Uh, perhaps out of all of the seven of these misunderstandings, uh, I might say that that is the, the most important one to understand and the one that's often most neglected uh, in, in making sure there's a distinction between trusting someone and forgiving someone. When we forgive someone for wronging us, it doesn't mean that we automatically trust them again. That's really, really important. Uh, all of them are important, though, um, and perhaps this next one that we're ready to get into now is perhaps equally important. Again, I think trusting is really important uh, to make that distinction. Sometimes, maybe I'd say that because we don't always take the time to think about what it means to trust someone. And so our understanding of trust is not all that clear sometimes, and our understanding of forgiving is not all that clear sometimes. And then we can kind of confuse those two, and we make forgiveness even harder than it already is if we don't understand that there's a distinction between forgiving and trusting. But this is important too. There's a distinction between forgiving and reconciling. So the sixth of the seven misunderstandings of forgiveness that I want to cover with you is, is uh, forgiveness does not mean reconciling with the person who wronged you. There's a difference between those things. And so I want to cover this maybe by, by addressing a different kind of question first, but maybe not drawing out the distinctions between forgiveness and reconciliation. Maybe we'll save that uh, for next time. But what, I'm gonna, what I want to do in this lesson is think about this question. It's a related question, and that is, do I have to forgive others if they don't repent? Uh, 
So if someone has wronged me and yet they're they're not repentant of that, they're not sorry, they don't acknowledge it, that it's a wrong, is there still a mandate to forgive? Am I still called to forgive that person biblically? And this question arises perhaps uh, most, uh, um, what would be the right word? It arises with the, with the greatest force, maybe we could say, because of a passage that we read in Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. Uh, and this is uh, something that Jesus says in that chapter. And so let me read these words uh, that Jesus says. He says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So, I mean, on, on the face of it, this teaching is very clear. Uh, if your brother sins against you, uh, you are to rebuke that brother, and if he repents, you forgive him. And so many people will read this passage and think that if the person doesn't repent, then you don't forgive him. And so that question is, is this what this passage teaches? Uh, in other words, we could kind of summarize this the, the view that would say, unless someone repents, you don't forgive him. It would be more along the lines of maybe formulating forgiveness like this or the... Um, formulating uh, the, the relational dynamics uh, along these lines. I'm willing to forgive someone who has wronged me. So I, I keep an openness to that forgiveness. So I'm willing to forgive someone who has wronged me, but I will only grant forgiveness, or maybe someone even put it this way, I can only grant that forgiveness on the condition of the wrongdoer's repentance. You're gonna just think back to those words that Jesus uses in the passage we just read in Luke chapter 17 if he repents. And so some will read into that, if he doesn't repent, you don't forgive him. If he repents, we have to forgive him. If he doesn't repent, we don't forgive him or her as the case may be. And so it's sometimes argued uh, alongside this passage uh, that leads to this initial formulation of I'm willing to forgive, but I'll only grant forgiveness on the condition of the wrongdoer's repentance. It's sometimes argued uh, that this is actually how God forgives us. God's forgiveness of us is only extended if we repent. But I want to ask the question, is, is that right? Is, is that the way that we should view this? Is God's forgiveness granted on the condition of our repentance? And so I guess let me say uh, at the outset, there are, there are people who land on both sides of this. Some will say, uh, yes, uh, this is how God grants forgiveness, and it is how we are to grant forgiveness, only on the condition of repentance. And there are others um, equally as committed to the scriptures who will say, uh, no, we actually can grant forgiveness apart from someone feeling any kind of remorse or repenting of that sin. In fact, we're mandated to do so. It's not only that we can, it's that that's precisely what the mandate addresses, that we are to f forgive regardless of whether someone repents or not. Um, but is this is this how God forgives? Uh, and that's that's kind of what I want to want to talk about and think, think, think through. And it is, it is complicated. And I'll just show my hand immediately that I don't think that this is right. I don't think that the answer to the question, are we only to forgive people if they repent? Uh, I think the answer to that question is no. We are to extend repentance, whether someone, uh, rep are we, we are to extend forgiveness, whether someone repents or not. And so let me, let me address this in maybe a couple different ways as we think through this. And it is, it's complicated. Like I said, people, people land on both sides of this. Um, but I, I hope to be persuasive as I, as I walk through uh, arguments for, um, for my position. I mean, something that's closely related to repentance is confessing our sins, right? Repentance and confess, uh, confessing are, are related. They're not the same, uh, the same thing. I'll grant that. But they are closely related. And think about this passage in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, that God, that's the he here, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if I were to read this passage in a similar way to the way some people read uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, where it says, if he repents, forgive him, with the understanding, unstated understanding, that if he doesn't repent, don't forgive him, I would read this to say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But if we don't confess our sins, he's not going to forgive us. Now, the difficulty with taking that reading is, if God's forgiveness of us is conditioned on our confession. What happens with sins that we fail to confess? Uh, we can fail to confess those sins because uh, we have forgotten to do so, 
Uh, we can fail to confess those sins because we're unaware that they're actually sinful. Uh, we do have, we do do things in ignorance uh, that we're still culpable of. Uh, we're, we're ignorant that we're committing an offense before the Lord, but we're still culpable of that. That still makes us guilty. But if I don't know out of ignorance that I'm committing the transgression, I'm not going to confess it. And if God's forgiveness of me is conditioned upon my conditioned upon my confession, well, then that becomes very problematic, doesn't it? And so we could apply that same thing to repentance. But I'll grant that uh, confessing our sins, though closely related to repentance, it's not the same as repentance. We wouldn't want to read this passage that way. And maybe we should be cautious to read uh, the Luke 17 passage that way as well as it relates to repentance. Maybe the other thing I would say, too, um, is even if you were to establish that God forgives us only on the basis of our forgiveness, um, that that doesn't necessarily say that's exactly the way we should forgive then. If God forgives this way, that's exactly how we are to forgive. Uh, as God has forgiven us, so you should forgive others. That's what maybe some uh, uh, on the other side of this argument would say, is that if, if God will only forgive us on the basis of repentance, then we should do so too, because it says we are to forgive just as God has forgiven you. Well, think about this passage in John chapter 13, verse 34. If we want to use that kind of language of, of equivocation, that um, if we're to forgive exactly the way God forgives us, um, then maybe we're to love just as God has loved us, like in John 13, 34. But think about that. Let's, let's take this to its uh, a logical conclusion, maybe. Uh, Jesus says this to his disciples in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, actually, that's not really a new commandment, right? That goes all the way back to Leviticus uh, in loving your neighbor as yourself. Love one another. But this is, this is the new part of it. Just as I have loved you. See, there's a new standard that's introduced here. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Okay, now again, on the, on the face of it, it seems uh, pretty obvious what Jesus is calling us to do. But think about how exactly does Jesus love us? How did Jesus love us as his disciples? Well, he laid down his life for us. He loved us sacrificially. And we, we are clearly to imitate that. Uh, 1 John, actually, he, he repeats this in his epistle, 1 John, where just as Christ laid down his life for us, we are to lay down our lives for others. But, but how specific do you want to equivocate that? Because here's how Jesus laid his life down. It wasn't in some kind of uh, a daily way where we sacrifice our own interests for the benefits of others, although that's true of Jesus, but it wasn't merely that. The way Jesus loved us in laying down his life was he was crucified physically on a Roman cross and he shed his blood. He poured out his life literally, physically, pouring out his blood in order to atone for the sins of his people. That's how he loved us. And so now we see him telling his disciples, which would include those of us who are following him in John chapter 13, verse 34, just as I have loved you in this way, you also are to love one another, which does that mean to give up our lives physically on a Roman cross to be crucified and pour out our blood as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of our brothers and sisters? Well, of course it doesn't mean that. We're incapable of doing that. So there, there is a point of analogy. There is a point of connection here that that is obvious. I, I'll grant that. It is obvious that just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. That means give yourself up for one another. Love one another sacrificially, uh, even to the point of physically dying, but, but not to the point of, of offering yourself as an atoning sacrifice in substitution, bearing the Father's wrath for another brother or sister because you're incapable of doing that. Uh, but, there, but there is a point of connection. There, there's a crossover in which our love can reflect that love that our Savior has had for us. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is there is a sense in which uh, the Father's forgiveness of us is conditional on our repentance. I'll acknowledge that uh, because you just think about it like this. I would say that ordinarily, and, and I guess that's, a, that's an important word too, ordinarily no one is saved apart from being converted. You have to be converted. And conversion consists of turning from your sins and repentance and placing your faith in Jesus for salvation. That's conversion. And apart from that, apart from repentance and believing in Jesus as your Savior, there is no salvation. 
And part of that salvation is forgiveness. And so we could just as simply say that unless you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus, there's no forgiveness of sins. There is a sense in which that's true, particularly at, a, at, at that point of conversion uh, where there's an initial work of saving grace in the heart of a person whereby they repent of their sins and the orientation of their life changes as a result of the new birth, as a result of regeneration. The orientation of their life changes from one towards sin to being away from sin and being united to Jesus and then growing in likeness of him. So there, there is that point of initial change of the orientation of one's life, a definitive change where the dominion of sin is broken and it's, there's, 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 a, there's a response of repentance in light of one's sin and faith in Jesus for salvation. So I'll grant that, that there is kind of an ordinary um, condition in that. And the reason I say ordinary is because I do believe that, that um, infants can be saved uh, by the blood of Jesus. And that happens with apart from, as far as we know, happens apart from some kind of presumed faith or repentance that an infant is exercising. So we believe that, that that's ordinarily how uh, salvation works, where faith and repentance are expressions of conversion. Uh, but I wouldn't say that that's hard and fast necessarily. But here, here's something else I think we have to consider. And it goes back to the lack of parallelism uh, between our forgiveness and God's forgiveness of us. Uh, other people repenting uh, before we forgive them and God forgiving us when we repent. One thing we want to say, and one thing I would want to stress very, very strongly, is that God's grace is clearly not contingent upon our repentance. So if we want to say that forgiveness is contingent on our repentance, okay, but I, I would still probably stop short of, of saying that, uh, that it's... Um, rigidly uh, contingent on one's repentance. Now, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, but what we, what we must say is that God's grace is clearly not contingent on our repentance. And so that means that God's forgiveness is not on the basis of our repenting of those sins. Uh, God's forgiveness of us is on the basis of his free grace toward us, exercised toward us while we're still sinners. Um, that grace toward us in Christ Jesus who atones for our sins. That's the basis of our forgiveness. Uh, God doesn't forgive us on the basis of our repentance of those sins. He is moving toward us in grace well before then. You think about something like this too. So when I said that there's kind of an initial conversion to be, uh, to be considered where the orientation of our life is definitively changed, but, but think about something like this. If we want to say that God's forgiveness of our sins is contingent or uh, conditioned by our repentance. Do we mean our ongoing repentance for sins that we've committed? So it kind of goes back to this category of confession. What about sins that we're ignorant of, that we don't repent of? I mean, think about, think about a scenario like this. If God's repentance or if God's forgiveness of us is strictly contingent upon our repentance of our sins. Think about somebody that's 55 years old, uh, has, has lived a, a life of, uh, uh, what would we say, uh, lived a life of open rebellion and immorality uh, before God, in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the world, um, has been uh, a drunk, uh, has been a womanizer, uh, has been a gambler, has squandered money, uh, has wronged lots of people, and then at the age of 55 uh, comes to faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, within six months of that time, uh, he is diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer, and say he dies. But in that six-month period of time where he was a Christian, uh, he had long-standing patterns of, of using filthy language. And no one really told him in his spiritual infancy uh, that he shouldn't be talking that way. And let, let's maybe just tie it to something explicit in the scriptures. Let's say he, he had a tendency to take the Lord's name in vain. And he would, he would curse using the Lord's name because it, it was something he was surrounded with for 55 years of his life. And then in six months, he became converted. But no one said, hey, um, you know, that's, that's a violation of, of God's moral law. And you need to repent of that. No one told him that. 
And so he had this six-month period of time where he put his faith in Christ, didn't repent of that sin, kind of continued along that, didn't sense much conviction about that, and then six months later died of an, of an aggressive form of cancer. Did God forgive that person's sins for that? Because he didn't repent from them. Um, think about a scenario like this as well. This, this kind of rigid idea that we have to repent of our sins as a condition for God's forgiveness, I think is why people, well, one of the reasons why people have probably concluded that suicide is an unforgivable sin. Because with suicide, by the nature of the sin, you don't have time to repent of it. But by the nature of taking one's own life, that, that there's no opportunity after that to repent. Uh, I happen to believe that suicide is not unforgivable. I don't think God judges us on the worst decisions that we make in our life when we've placed our faith in Jesus. And I, but nor would I say that God withholds his forgiveness of us unless we repent of them. And, and we raise the question, to what to re repent to what degree? The, Pur the Puritans had uh, some really good insights about uh, the insufficiency of our repentance to merit anything before the Lord. Uh, they would talk about how we need to repent of our repentance because it's always incomplete. Uh, how many times have I repented of a sin and gone back to it? Well, okay, how genuine was my repentance to begin with? And how genuine does my repentance have to be to actually merit, if you want to say that, or, or, or to meet the condition, to, to soften it a little bit, how, how thorough and complete does my repentance need to be in order to meet the condition of God forgiving it? It, just, it, it, it raises so many unhelpful questions to have this view that we can only forgive people if they repent of their sins because that's the way that God forgives us. Um, because here, here's where the analogy begins to break down. And this is where, if you're not understanding how this relates to reconciliation, the difference between forgiveness and recon reconciliation, this is where maybe it'll, it'll start becoming a little bit more clear. This is where the analogy breaks down because, uh, between God granting us forgiveness in light of our repentance and us granting other people forgiveness, whether they repent or not. And that's because God, by his grace, he grants forgiveness in a broader context of salvation. In other words, when God is forgiving us of our sins, that's not all he's doing. That comes, with, uh, it comes in a broad context of salvation involving an integrated set of divine operations in which God is able to effect. And that's an important word there. That God is able to effect what he intends in the heart of the person that he's forgiving. And so what God is doing in this broader context of salvation is not just forgiving sins. What he's doing is moving toward a person in grace whereby he regenerates their dead hearts and makes that heart alive. And that heart that has now been made alive is given the grace of faith and repentance. God actually grants the conditions that he requires ordinarily. In other words, if we can't be converted apart from faith and repentance, if that's a condition of our salvation, well, what makes salvation still of grace is that God is the one by his spirit who's granting or enabling, empowering those conditions. He gives those to us as a gift. Think about faith in scripture is mentioned as a gift of God in Ephesians chapter two. Repentance is mentioned as something that God grants in 2 Timothy chapter two and in Acts. I can't remember the exact passage, but Acts, um, the gift of repentance is mentioned or God granting repentance is, is mentioned. It's because he confers that condition by his grace. And that broader context of salvation is God is also justifying the sinner, forgiving the sinner, adopting the sinner unto this broader goal of reconciling the sinner to himself. But it's all of grace because God can effect that by the power of his spirit. And so when God moves towards someone in grace with the goal of reconciling them, he does forgive them, even on the condition of forgive, or even on the condition of faith and repentance. But the difference with God is He affects that very faith and repentance that are conditions for that forgiveness. If that makes sense, if it doesn't make sense, you can go back and watch the video again. Hopefully, it'll be it'll be clear as you hear a second or third time. But I said that the word effect is really really important, and it's really really important because when it comes to me and my relationship with others, if someone has wronged me. I can't effect a change in their heart. I can't move them toward repentance with my grace. I can only forgive them for that transgression. And I should forgive them whether they repent of that or not. Uh, because 
I'm, I'm not effecting a kind of reconciliation, which forgiveness opens the door toward, that our forgiveness ought to be unto reconciliation, just as God's forgiveness is unto reconciliation. Uh, but God effects the reconciliation by a broader work in the heart that I don't have the power to do. All I can do is extend that forgiveness to someone who has transgressed against me. Uh, so a, a couple last things to think about here uh, is that Jesus, um, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, as he's being crucified, offers a prayer to his father to forgive his crucifiers. And he doesn't mention anything about their repentance. He says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. It's an act of ignorance. Now, we, 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 we could look at that in two ways, right? We could say, well, Jesus praised the Father for forgiveness, but they're not going to be forgiven for that unless they repent of that sin. Or we could say this, which is what I would actually say about this passage. We could say that Jesus intercedes for his crucifiers before the Father to forgive him for that sin of crucifying him, for which they will not be held culpable for before the throne of God in the day of judgment. They will not be condemned because they hammered nails into the hands and feet of Jesus. I could be wrong. My position would be they are not going to be uh, condemned for that. They'll be condemned for remaining in their unbelief in the risen Christ, but they will not be held accountable for that sin. Oh, why would I say that? Because Jesus just prayed for their forgiveness. And the only other option for that is to say that the son interceded before the father, at least on one occasion where his intercession was ineffective. He interceded for sinners at least on one occasion where his intercession was ineffectual. And, and, and I would rather land at the position that no, his intercession before the Father is always effectual on behalf of sinners. And so these particular sinners who crucified him are forgiven of that particular sin because he asked the Father to forgive that particular sin, but they'll still be held accountable for their continued unbelief if they remained in unbelief. And I don't know if they did or not. I hope that they didn't. Um, but if they remained in their unbelief, uh, then they'll be condemned for that unbelief, but not for those actions, but they didn't repent of that. Uh, Jesus prayed for their forgiveness apart from their repentance. He was praying for their forgiveness. He was asked the Father to forgive them, um, not because they were sorry. They weren't sorry. So we have at least one instance of that. Another thing to think about, to balance this out with uh, the Luke chapter uh, 17 words, where Jesus says, if he repents, forgive him. Think about Mark chapter 11, verse 25, where Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Probably didn't read that very well. Let me, let me nuance that. Um, let me cadence that a little bit different. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But notice what he says. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. He doesn't say anything about the other people being repentant or sorry or not. Just extend that forgiveness so your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. The last couple of things here, and I'll wrap this up. Now we're going a little bit over. Um, but here's a question I would have too. If one is going to conclude that you only have to forgive someone, and which I, again is probably, it's not the, the spiritual way to say it. And so maybe those who would, who would land on the other side wouldn't put it in those terms. So let me, let me be fair. Um, you can't, let me maybe say it this way. That those who would who would say you can't forgive someone uh, who's not repentant by the very nature of the case, you can't forgive someone unless they're repentant. I would ask this question, given on our working definition. So then is a renouncing of bitterness, resentment, and malice toward the person who wronged us, as well as letting go of claims to personal vengeance and opting for love, care, and goodness over evil, conditional on the wrongdoer repenting? In other words, if someone is not repentant, then... I really don't have a call to renounce my bitterness, resentment, and malice toward the person who wronged me. I may choose to do it, but I don't, there, there's no mandate to that. Um, as well as letting go of claims of personal vengeance. I'm not called to do that unless the person repents. I don't have to opt for love, care, and goodness over evil unless the person repents. If, the, if this is what forgiveness is, and I've tried to ground this in the understanding of things like afiemi and korizomai, these Greek words, that are reflected in this definition. If if you missed those earlier lessons, you can go back in earlier videos and, and see where I unpack that and arrived at this definition. But um, if this conditional forgiveness view is correct, then it seems like 
then unless someone's repentant, then all these things are still in play for me. And my position would be they're not. That, that forgiveness is doing this, whether the person is repentant or not. Because I would say that forgiveness is something that transpires in the heart of a person, in an individual person. Forgiveness is something that's transpiring in my heart towards someone that's wronged me. Um, it's not something that's transpiring between parties. Forgiveness is something that's happening in my heart. It's not something that's happening between two parties. However, reconciliation is something that's happening between two parties. And so again, that's why God is effecting a certain thing in his forgiveness, which is part of a broader work of divine operations by his spirit because it's untoward or unto reconciliation. Um, but reconciliation and forgiveness are not the same things. Reconciliation involves two parties where forgiveness is something that's happening in my heart. So now we're back to the sixth misunderstanding of forgiveness, and that is that forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. So we'll come back and pick that up in the next uh, video lesson, as well as probably look at the seventh of the misunderstandings uh, so we can wrap this section up. So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, please join me uh, for the next video where we talk about uh, reconciliation and the seventh of the misunderstandings as well. But until then, God bless you. See you then.